Good evening, Fright Fiends. Tis I, Erlik the Gorelord, a god to some, devil to others, but a film buff to all. And I welcome you back for yet another cut into horror history. I tell you, dear mortals, digging up these old vinyl cadavers has gotten me, well, reminiscing a bit, uh, reflecting on a time when one could smell a certain panic in the air. Now, like me, I'm sure some of you are, well, old enough to remember a time when you couldn't turn on a daytime TV show and not hear stories of ritual abuse and devil worship. A time when people thought that their neighbors, their friends, even members of their own family were sacrificing babies by the light of the moon. Now, unfortunately, Almost all of those stories were untrue, but by the end of the 80s, even Hollywood was cashing in on the craze. Which reminds me of an old film, one that came about uh, right at the peak of the whole thing, a supernatural thriller that bears both cultural elements of its time as well as the mark of the beast. Join me now as I slice into yet another prime cut of horribly good horror and take a look at what exactly grants one the first power. While released on the 6th of April 1990, the first power is very much a late 80s style supernatural thriller. We are first introduced to Sister Marguerite, played by Elizabeth Arian, who's busy pleading with her superiors over some recent headlines about a rash of cult killings that are gripping the greater Los Angeles area. Now, of course, fearing ridicule, her superiors heed not her warnings, and she goes back to doing whatever it is that nuns do, and not worrying about spiritual matters. We next meet our protagonist, Detective Russell Logan, played by Lou Diamond Phillips, still quite popular after starring in La Bamba, Stand and Deliver, and Young Guns. While his cat is busy eating pizza, Detective Logan is sitting in the dark, hard at work trying to piece together the pentagram killings, a string of occult-themed murders that have been tormenting the city for some time. Tis then he gets a phone call from a mysterious woman who also likes to lay around in the dark, and she tells Logan that she knows where the killer will strike next. Keep going. Wait. Keep going. And just checking. The mystery woman tells him she will divulge the location of the next murder, but under the condition that Logan see to it they don't seek the death penalty if the killer is captured. Logan is so busy doing, well, whatever it is he's doing, that he makes her a half-assed promise just to get what he wants. Does this uh, sound familiar, ladies? <sighs> Logan puts together a stakeout and the cops take to the streets awaiting the arrival of the pentagram killer. In the rain, we have a would-be bomb, a would-be couple, and a would-be streetwalker, Carmen, played by Sue Giosa, who is busy being me too by Detective Maza, played by Clayton Landy. 
who incidentally played the asshole orderly who sexually harassed the character Taryn in A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3, The Dream Warriors. Ah, to be typecast as a sultan of sleaze. While the rest of the team is busy either waiting or harassing, Logan is late to his own stakeout. He and his partner, Ali, played by Bubba Gump himself, Michael T. Williamson, are racing to the scene. And it turns out that not only is Ali apprehensive, but that Logan is a bit of an asshole. You know what your problem is, Ali? All this mumbo-jumbo occult bullshit's got you spooked. Guy's got you thinking he's the boogeyman of the Ku Klux Klan. Fuck you. Let's fuck you, sir. <laughs> Meanwhile, Carmen stops to admire a pretty pussy when... <laughs> she is taken to a cave-like crevice somewhere deep in the park, and this is where we meet the man who has been doing the devil's handiwork, Patrick Channing played to perfection by Jeff Cooper. The team realizes that Carmen is missing and they race into the park to save her. Of course, it is Logan and his oversized 1989 shoulder pads that find her, and the fight is on. We quickly learn that Logan can't shoot with a down, but that he does indeed have guts. <sighs> Despite having been stuck like a piggy piggy, Logan makes the arrest his third in five years. The third serial killer in five years. He should work for the fucking FBI. He heals from his injuries and then struts towards the court to see to it that justice is served. Rather than take their high-profile murderer to an undisclosed entrance, the police bring Channing right to the front of the fucking building, where he is not only vulnerable to attack, but where he and Logan can have this lovely little exchange. You're not gonna let these pussies wimp out of me, are you? I mean, if a twisted scumbag like me doesn't deserve the big one, who does? Right on, I'm with you, pal. I knew I could count on you, Russ. I owe you one. See you around, buddy boy. I doubt it. Channing is handed a death sentence, and then it is party time back at the precinct. Help your hammer on Give it to me! Give it to me! Hey, come on! Sister Agnes, I'm sorry. No sooner is Logan done fucking his desk, and he gets yet another call from the mystery woman who tells him to stop the execution, but offers no explanation as to why. Channing gets gassed, but comes back, and his stuntman punctures the chamber glass, and he moves in on Logan. Only... Pizza, pizza. It's a fucking dream. Logan gets out of bed and we see that his stomach has healed quite well. He goes on to ensure he has not any kind of intruder and then this happens. Need you. There's an emergency. They'll have to wait. Get the evidence text here right now. What's going on? I got a fucking bloodbath in my. Sir, they told us to bring you immediately. Yes, uh, disregard that snappy demand for evidence text and, uh, oh, and that mention of a bloodbath, for they have bigger fish to fry. It turns out that Carmen has been taken back to the cave. It's Carmen, man. That was much needed exposition. I guess nobody bothered to tell Logan until he got there. 
Logan is visited at work by the mystery woman, a psychic named Tess, played by Tracy Griffith. She tells Logan that Carmen was killed by Channing, and of course Logan takes this about as seriously as anybody would, but no matter. They have found Carmen's killer, a ratty catatonic man who has no reaction to anything. Logan knows that something is amiss, and he and Ali head to Tessa's apartment, uh, you know, to see if they can uncover anything. Man, it wouldn't hurt if we had a warrant. We'll just tell the judge we had a psychic hunch. And who needs a warrant when you've got a lockpick set? I mean, come on. After breaking and entering in an unlawful search, Logan decides to listen to the answering machine, where he hears this. Looks like the score is pentagram 16, LAPD 1. Nah, not even one, huh, Logan? How about a romantic rendezvous? Church across from Alvera Street. Buenos dias, buddy boy. For some reason, Tess wasn't able to sense people in her home and comes back a bit, uh, rightfully pissed. But only the message is gone, and rather than apologize, Logan decides to assault her. Oh yeah, listen, don't fuck with me! Let go of me! There's a woman dead, a good cop, and you had something to do Let with it! Let go of me! Despite endangering the psychic civilian, they head to the church where Channing has possessed the body of a Mexican carriage driver and decides to uh, honor the unfortunate horror trope of killing off the black guy within the first third of the movie. Get an ambulance. After winning delayed reaction of the year, Logan chases Channing through an abandoned building and onto a rooftop where... See you around, buddy boy. Soon after Channing's escape, they find the body of Me Too Maza, who either fell victim to Channing or finally complimented the wrong ass, but who knows. Confused and shaken, Logan takes refuge in a church where he decides to ask a priest about the power of possession. Before I answer your question, it is necessary that I ask you one of my own, my son. What is it, Father? How's the stomach, buddy boy? <laughs> oh, it's doing dandy. Channing goes all Matrix before there was such a thing, and then is chased into a squalid hotel, where he turns a ceiling fan into a saw-like propeller and sends Logan and Tess fleeing for their lives. They make it to the street where Logan uses another one of his hip thrusts to stop an oncoming car. Only this happens. Not one of those anti-cop types! You need help with some creeps! <laughs> Channing manages to hang on for some time, but they are ultimately able to shake off the dummy put in his stuntman's place. It is then that Tess mentions she knows someone who might be able to help, and they go to the convent to see Sister Marguerite. How Tess knows of Marguerite is a head-scratcher, but it matters not, as they are basically told to fuck off. Even though Channing is jumping from body to body faster than Charlie Sheen, they decide to uh, grab a drink, which is where we learn that not only Tess knows her shit when it comes to scotch, but that Bill Mosley makes for one hell of a bartender. The two do a bit of strategizing, but Logan quickly proves he doesn't make for a good drinking buddy. You've got to believe in this. You always talk this much? I mean, it's no wonder your boyfriend split. 
After getting a buzz, they decide to pose as reporters and go to Channing's boyhood home, where they meet his grandmother, played by Juliana McCarthy, who you might remember from Starship Troopers, or possibly the Frighteners. It turns out that Mrs. Channing is in denial about her grandson's crimes, and for some reason doesn't seem to recognize the cop who was all over the press after putting him away. But she agrees to let the two strangers both into her home and into Patrick's room, which is untouched and looks like it belongs to fucking Pennywise the Clown. It is there that Tess has another vision, and realizes Logan isn't the only one who enjoys hopping things that he shouldn't. Mommy! No, Grandpa, no! Grammy! Grammy, you will make it stop! Help us! Patrick! Patrick! What's he doing? Help me! Is he hurting her? Patrick, is he hurting her? Grandpa, don't touch her! Mrs. Channing finally realizes that she's been duped, and Tess flees up behind the house with Logan in tow. Tis then they go into the old water system and find his hideaway. He's going to kill again. When I see that... Keep going. Marguerite, meanwhile, is stealing relics from the old church and preparing to do battle with the evil one. While driving out of the Channing hideaway, Logan gets a call on the CB. Only once he heads off to tend to the call, it is revealed there is something a bit more sinister happening. Attention all units, officer needs assistance. 2130 Julian. You know which officer needs help, don't you, sweet gigs? It's Logan. Tess races to help Logan, and the two of them have quite the adventure with Channing, who after being impaled, turns out is actually one of Logan's fellow officers. Exhausted. And out of options, they flee to Logan's apartment, where of course Channing would never think to go, but not before stopping to toss a few shillings at a random bag lady sleeping outside. Oh, Los Angeles. They do get more strategizing, and even share a kiss, because it wasn't the late 80s or early 90s without confirming a love interest. Then suddenly... Tess, there's nothing out there. Don't you think I look pretty, Logan? <laughs> Not nice to hit a lady! You know, this little exchange looks kind of familiar. After shaking off the ghost of Christmas bag ladies, they flee in Logan's car, only to find that much like uh, an Uber driver with an unruly nut job in their vehicle, keeping the rubber on the road can be a little bit of a challenge. We quickly learn that Tess and the discount Carol Kane are gone, which means Channing's got her, and that the rest of Logan's body heals as quickly as his abdomen, because he is off to see Marguerite, who this time agrees to help and goes with him to Patrick's lair. Will they get there in time to save Tess? Will Channing jump into any more bodies? Will Logan's shoulder pads prove to be helpful? Now, on the one hand, it would be easy to lump the first power in with films like Shocker and The Horror Show, Bad Dreams, and other post-Elm Street supernatural slashes of the 1980s. 
As Logan, Phillips does a good enough job, but doesn't seem particularly adjusted within the role. Some of the writing decisions, like the ceiling fan turns propeller, could have used some reconsidering, and shooting around suspension cables would have been nice. But the film also seems a bit rushed and broken when it comes to its backstory. However, the first power has some delightfully unnerving scenes, and Jeff Cooper's portrayal of Patrick Channing alone makes the film worth a watch. Tracy Griffith plays Tess with just enough toughness and vulnerability to make her a memorable character as well, and a good counterpart to the character of Logan. All said, I give this satanic panic-stricken supernatural adventure two and a half out of five Logan hip thrusts. I am Merlick the Gore Lord, and until next time... See you around, buddy. See you around, buddy. Boy. 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 Boy.